This is Deepika Bari. I'm from the English department. And it is my very great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Shape Lecture in India series, hosted by the Carlos Museum and co-sponsored by the English department. For over 20 years, it's been a while, Jagdish and Madhu. For over 20 years, Madhu and Jagdish Shet have supported our attempts to bring the very best minds in Indian studies and culture to Emory. That's you, Chitra, the very best of minds, the best of the best. Professor Jagdish Shet is Charles H. Kelstad Professor of Marketing in the Goisweta Business School, and his wife, Madhu, is a former teacher. So they've both been dedicated to supporting education and the arts for a very long time. Jagdish has published numerous books, I've lost count, um, and more than 200 articles on marketing. Madhu has served as president of the Jain Society of Greater Atlanta and spearheaded a fundraising effort to build the first Jain Center in Atlanta. Jagdish and Madhu's philanthropy and support of events such as this one show us all how to belong meaningfully to our environment by investing in it and shaping it and whenever possible donating to it. Thank you very much, Jagdish and Madhu. Thanks are also due to a person who has been working very quietly behind the scenes to arrange every detail of today's event. That person is characteristically invisibilized herself. In the back of the room, that would be Elizabeth Horner. She is the Associate Museum Director for Public Programs at Carlos. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. You are here, of course, to hear the author Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni's words, not mine. So I'll keep uh, my remarks short, except to remind you that copies of her book are available on the first level at the Carlos Museum Bookstore. And the author will be signing these books right here, somewhere right around here after the lecture and reading. And another reminder, please do stay for the reception in honor of Chitra just beyond these doors in the foyer. This weekend, Indians are celebrating their new year. To those from the homeland, happy Baisakhi, Shubo Novoborsho, a very happy new year. We know that it's a particularly happy new year when it brings us a writer of the caliber of Chitra. Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni, is the Betty and Jean McDavid Professor of Writing at the University of Houston's Creative Writing Program. Professor Divakaruni has several awards for the 21 books to her credit, which include novels and collections of poetry and short stories. If you haven't read her poetry, you've missed out. This was what made me first fall in love with Chitra's writing. Her books have been translated into 30 languages. Two of her novels, The Mistress of Spices and Sister of My Heart, as well as a short story, The Word Love, have been adapted into films. Oleander Girl, Palace of Illusions, One Amazing Thing, and her latest novel, Independence, have all been optioned for the movies or for television serials. I've got my fingers crossed and my breath held to see this material come on screen soon. The first time I invited, oops, I think I'm gonna date myself here. Um, I'll tell you anyway. Uh, the first time I invited Chitra to Emory was in 1997, which was to a packed hall. So many books and so many awards later, we know that Chitra's writing continues to speak, uh, speak to us now as it did then. Why is that? For one thing, Chitra has written with her finger on the pulse 
of immigrants negotiating loss and gain. Her poetry and fiction sketch the colors, smells, and sounds of difference against an unvariable American landscape. But they also remind us of the sameness of human desires. As Tilo, the mistress of spices, observes, I quote, even here in this new land, America, this city which prides itself on being no older than a heartbeat, it is the same things we want again and again. Today, Chitra will be speaking to us about her latest novel, Independence, which depicts the experiences of three sisters in strife-torn Calcutta as India frees itself from the British yoke. This is not her first foray into history. In fact, Chitra's work is shaped by it, and you can hear its thrum throughout her writing. Whether it's her poetry, the reason for Nestertians or Black Candle, her early collections, or the novel The Vine of Desire, and many others. But when Chitra writes about history, it is a tale not only of events, but a saga set to the beat of the human heart. She has never let us forget that whatever her subject, her writing is about that fundamental and unending human endeavor in her words, quote, a search for beauty, a belief in luck, a hope that happiness will endure. She is a writer whose ability to understand and write about the lives of others have made her so very dear to us all. Please join me in welcoming one amazing writer, Chitra Banerjee Divakaran. Thank you for that very generous introduction, Deepika. You can tell Deepika is completely biased because we have now been friends for many years. But thank you. I'm not going to argue with all the nice things you said. <laughs> thank you all for being here today. I want to thank all of the organizers, especially Dr. Jagdish Shet for inviting me and Madhuji for being such a wonderful hostess. Everyone at the Carlos Museum, everyone at the university who's been uh, promoting this event, thank you all so much. And thank you all for taking time this Sunday afternoon, where I'm sure that you have so many wonderful opportunities um, to educate and amuse yourselves. So many wonderful events and distractions. So I'm very happy that you have all chosen the best one. So we're going to make this a kind of friendly, uh, you know, non-academic kind of event. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this book, Independence. I'll tell you about how I came to write it and why I wrote it. And I also wanted to talk about, yeah, some of the interesting things about this book and why I feel it's important both in India today and in America today. So, but first, a little show and tell, my sorry. <laughs> for, <laughs> for those in the know, this is a very particular kind of sari. It's a kata sari from Bengal. And kata is very important in this book because it is very central to the folk art of Bengal. And it is a folk art practiced by women and by the women in this book right around the time of independence. Um, this book is about one particular family where the mother and one of the daughters are very skilled kata makers. Now, I also, you know, it's, it's kind of a rite of passage for Bengali girls, especially if you have like um, a rural connection. So, and we did, my grandfather lived in a village about three hours outside of Kolkata. Uh, very similar to the village of Ranipur that is in this book. So when I, I would go spend my holidays with my grandfather and my aunt in the village, and I was taught to make uh, kantas, which are little quilts usually for babies. 
Um, I must confess, my account, I never looked like this. But it, you know, it served the purpose, which was when babies were born, you wrapped them in kata, and then you had to wash the kata many times, obviously. <laughs> so my katas were good for that. Um, I have a story about this kata, which relates to uh, my belief that this world is full of amazing things that we don't expect, which actually relates to my other book, which I will talk about in just a minute, because I have another event on Tuesday, and my hope is that if you are free, you will come to that event. It's a very different kind of event. And if you have friends in the area, you will tell them about it. But so one day I teach at the University of Houston. Uh, I teach in the wonderful creative writing program over there. It's an internationally acclaimed program. I'm very honored to be part of it. One day I walked in there into my office and on my desk was this sari. No notes, no nothing. So I'm like, oh, this sorry, where did it come from? And I should just leave that story there, right? I shouldn't tell you where it actually came from. It's more exciting that way. Okay, all right, all right. You have no sense of drama. You have no sense. Of... Okay, but <laughs> but I will tell you. So later, I found out that our business manager, a wonderful woman named Carol, had received this as a gift from a friend who went to India. But Carol realized that she would never wear a sari. And therefore she gave it to me, which was very nice. So, and now that, you know, now that I'm here and wearing this sari and, and so I let Carol know, and I think she's happy about it. Uh, there's another reason I wore this sari. It's because it's the same sari that's on the cover of Cover Magazine. <laughs> yes, people, I am a cover girl. <laughs> or should I say a cover girl? <laughs> so, of course, I had to wear this so sari also for that reason. So, enough of all this levity. Let's move to serious things. So this is a story set in the 1940s, right before independence, uh, during our freedom struggle. And it is a story about a family, a family of three daughters, three girls, who navigate that time as difficult things happen to them. I'll tell you a little bit about the difficult things without giving away too much of the story. In 1946, the three girls and their mother and father decide to go to Kolkata from the village of Ranipur. Each of these girls is very different. Each one has a very different dream about what they want their lives to be like. And when they go to Kolkata, this is in the summer, in August of 1946, they're girls just like any other girl in any other country who might be like in their 19, 20, that age group. But something happens when they are there. Something terrible will happen that will change their lives, that will bring history right into their families and into their homes. And they will lose their father. Because at that time in Kolkata, all over India, actually, uh, a meeting was called, a meeting was called by Jinnah, and it was called Direct Action Day. And it was a day when uh, Muslims would come together uh, to demand a separate country for themselves. In many cities, it was a quiet meeting. It worked out fine, but in Kolkata, it turned into a huge riot. And my mother was in Kolkata at that time. And she has told me about Direct Action Day. So it changed the lives of the girls. They lost their father. They lost stability. Um, they lost their faith in people because people that they knew turned on each other and were killing each other. It was just a very difficult time. Anyway, the girls will go on with their lives. Now their dreams have changed. Now they're going to struggle. Now they're going to make some difficult choices. and they're going to learn what does independence really mean. Their mother will also learn this. What does independence really mean, not only at the level of a country, but at the level of 
all the people of that country, and not only all the people of the country, but specifically women. What does independence mean for women? And can a country be truly independent unless its women are allowed independence? So that's kind of the story it will, thank you. That's, uh, that is, um, it, it's a theme that I've been interested in, women's independence, women's freedom, women, women's choices. It comes back over and over in many of my books. But a little bit about why I wrote this book. So actually, and, and someone was asking me earlier, well, where do you get ideas for your books? So, um, you know, the truth answer to that is I often don't know where my ideas come from. It's not as though they come from a conscious part of my mind. They really come from somewhere much deeper. One morning I wake up and I have an idea and the idea keeps kind of growing inside me until I just have to start on the process of writing it, which is probably start doing research for it, especially for the historical novels. But this one, I knew very clearly that I was going to write it because my previous novel, which some of you might know about, it's called The Last Queen. And it is about Maharani Jinda Kaur, who was the youngest wife of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. It was about how after his death, she became queen regent and she fought very bravely um, to keep the kingdom of Punjab from being taken over by the British. But in the end, she could not succeed. There was treachery from within her kingdom and the British did take over. Okay, the British took over and uh, she, was, she was imprisoned. She was most illegally. They took over first as a protectorate, but very soon after that, they decided protecting is not what they wanted to do. So they imprisoned her. They took her son. They took the Kohinoor. Uh, you know, you, you all know about the Kohinoor. And they took him and the Kohinoor to England, where he grew up. Anyway, uh, there will be, in, in that story, there is a meeting of mother and son after many years. It's very, it's absolutely true and dramatic and heartbreaking all at once. But I, I didn't want to end my foray into Indian history at that very tragic moment in our history where, you know, the British were in power, um, the first war of Indian independence in 1857 had failed and it was a dark time. I didn't want to end with that. I had to follow that arc to its final finality where the British would have to leave and India would gain her freedom. And that became independence. So it was really important for me to chase this. Uh, some of the material over here People ask me, well, where did you research? Where do you do your research? And for every book, research is a little different. But for both of these historical novels that I just talked about, much of the research came from reading newspapers of the times. Because I think newspapers of the time really give you the feel of the moment. What were people feeling? What were people thinking? What were people... Um, looking at the pictures, the photographs that came out in the newspapers, they were very important for my research as well. They gave me a real sense of being there at the time. And as you might imagine, they were wonderful photographs of you know, the first day of independence, the first time the flag is flying in India, in a free India, um, Nehru giving his speech, all of the people in Delhi outside of uh, Red Fort, all of that was very wonderful, but you also saw pictures of partition because partition is the other side of the coin of Indian independence. And we saw all those trains with people just going back and forth, trying to get to the right side of the border. And we saw, uh, you know, pictures of dead people, lots and lots of dead people, and many things that weren't even in the photographs. But I think what, where I got a lot of the, the human feel of the times is from stories that my grandfather and my mother, who both lived in India, in Kolkata, or in the village, going back and forth, what they told me, 
and how it felt. I got a sense of how it felt, both the hope and the fear, both the, this feeling of immense achievement as India became free, and then immense terror as the partition battles began, the partition which, uh, when I researched, I found out, killed almost one million people. And the saddest thing was these were people who had been living fairly peacefully side by side until some kind of insanity hit us. So independence is at once a novel that is about how, how we can achieve maybe the unimaginable, how we can reach great goals when we come together as a people, a nation, forgetting our differences. And also when differences become so important that we turn on each other, how much horror that can cause. So, and it's not just what happened at that time, right? We're seeing that in all over the world now, right? The sense of difference, the sense that we cannot get along, the sense that we cannot discuss things intelligently and come to a conclusion or a solution that will help everybody, right? So we're seeing that in India and we're seeing that in the U United States. So I feel in some ways, this book is really a book as much for our time as for any other time. And I hope if you read this book, you will agree. I thought I will read to you a little bit. Oh, I have to tell you another thing about how I wrote this book. So the book is about the three sisters and each chapter will be from the point of view of one of the sisters. Now, when I started writing the book, however, um, I was writing it in first person. So each chapter would be from the sister's point of view, but in her voice. So the oldest sister, uh, Deepa, would have a chapter, then the middle sister, Jamini, and then the youngest sister, Priya. And they all have secrets, by the way. I, I'm kind of fond of secrets in books, aren't you? <laughs> it makes books interesting. But the secrets are also a very uh, deep and sometimes uh, painful part of human life. So the way in which the women navigate the secrets is important. But as I was writing it, now I was three quarters of the way through the book. The book has now been sold in India and in the US. I've been given a deadline. And one morning I wake up and I'm like, I'm doing this all wrong. I have done this all wrong. And first person isn't giving us the story of the nation. And this is not only the story of individuals, it is also the story of the nation. It's how these stories intersect. So I, I tell my husband, Murthy, who I want to acknowledge for a moment, although he doesn't like me to acknowledge him, but he is uh, a great support. He's one of the reasons I can write. <laughs> no, truly, I am so thankful to him for you know, being so supportive. Anyway, I tell Murthy, I think I have to rewrite this book. And Murthy's like, oh, don't tell me this. I do not want to hear it. So anyway, I write a chapter, a very crucial chapter in the book. I rewrite it in third person. I send it to both of my editors in India and in the US. And I say, this is what I need to do. And this is why I need to do it. And what do you think of the, the, the new chapters? And they both write back to me individually. I didn't let them know that I'm writing to you. And they both say, this is so much better. Absolutely. We think, I think you should write it in third person. However, your deadline is still your deadline. <laughs> so now I'm writing like night and day. I literally, the book, you know, the voice just came through me. People are asking like, where do I get? I can't, I, I really can't take credit. It was like, this voice just came through me and I wrote this book and I was writing night and day. In fact, people sometimes ask me, well, how do you manage writing with the rest of your life, you know, with family, with social work, with activism, with uh, being a teacher. And the truth is when I'm really in the middle of writing, I have no work-life balance. I have no balance with other things. The writing just has to come first. And so, I mean, I was writing for such long hours that I 
developed a really bad backache. And so then we have a recliner and that's the only thing I could sit on. So this book is written <laughs> in a recliner like that. But I'll read you a section. So that is, that's a little bit I wanted to share. You know, sometimes that's what the writing life looks like. Um, it's on a recliner. <laughs> it's in a recliner. But I wanted to read you a little bit from a portion of the book, and then we'll throw it open for questions. Easy questions. So I can provide uh, brilliant answers. I want to read to you from two portions of the book to give you a sense of some of the revision that I did, right? And before that, I want to read from the beginning where I have a quotation uh, from the writer Amrita Pritam, who many of you know, and if you don't, I really do recommend. She writes both poetry and prose. She has written about, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, too much excitement here. So Amrita Pritam has written a poetry and prose, and she has written very uh, movingly about partition and independence. And here she uh, wrote something that really relates to this book. There are many stories which are not written on paper, but are written on the bodies and minds of women. I'm just gonna read that again just because I love it so much. There are many stories which are not written on paper, but are written on the bodies and minds of women. And if we can bring some of those stories to life, I think that is a very important thing to do. And I want to, for, for just a moment, I want to recognize that that is being done, bringing those stories to life, allowing those women to move forward with their lives, because a lot of those stories are not pleasant stories. They're not upbeat stories, but they're very important stories. So I want to um, acknowledge all the people from Raksha who are in the audience here. It, would you please stand up? Please stand up. Okay. Because Raksha is changing lives. Raksha is changing lives, not just in Atlanta, but you know, lives that go many places. They're working with women in situations of abuse and domestic violence. That is a cause very close to my heart. I've been working in that field for, I don't know, 30 years now, first in California, then in Houston, but we all work together. We all help each other. Sometimes a woman needs to be sent away from one city to a whole other part of the country. So we all work together. The stories on the bodies and minds of those women. Anyway, moving on, this is Direct Action Day night. Uh, our family, the three girls, their mother, Bina, and their father, Nabokumar, have been safely inside a house. They, ha they don't even know what's happened because no one expected any of this to happen. But they listen to the radio in the evening and they hear the tales of terrible violence. Parts of Kolkata have just gone up in flame. Um, yeah, just violence on every side. And Navakumar works in a little clinic part of the time, which he runs along with his, Navakumar is Hindu, he runs it along with his friend from medical college days, Dr. Abdullah, and he calls Dr. Abdullah and he says, why don't you come here? Because this part of the city is safe. He is staying in the home of a very rich friend and he says, you know, there are guards, uh, you come over here. And um, Abdullah says, no, my nephew and I are at the clinic because there are so many wounded people and they have come there and we are helping them. We can't leave them. And when Nabokumar hears that, he says, well, I can't leave you in that dangerous place and be safe at home. I could never live with myself if I did that. 
So he decides to go and he does get to the clinic, but then he will get wounded as he's trying to move more, um, you know, other wounded people into the clinic. And the, his wife and his three daughters find out about that and they're determined, they know that he's hurt. They know that he might die. They're determined to go and see him before that happens. And so Abdullah sends his nephew Raza to kind of navigate the streets, to help them navigate the streets. And the son of his friend uh, is also going to go with them. So here is the, the four women, two men, they're going through the night, they're going through a city that is burning and is filled with just slaughter. Uh, because they're going to go through a Muslim part of town, um, Raza has brought burqas for them to wear so that they'll be safer. And I'll read from there. Now they hurry down the alley, six of them stepping shadow to shadow, startling at every sound. Raza in front, Amit, that's the son of uh, the host behind, the women huddled in the center. Raza had brought a skull cap for Amit and for the women, burqas that belong to nurse Salima. They will be safer this way because they're crossing a Muslim neighborhood. Priya's burqa smells of clove and garlic. Through its net veil, the world shimmers unreal. Deepa supports Bina. Jamini clutches Priya's hand damply. Priya hears Bina whisper. She's telling their father, Nabukumar, to hold on until she arrives. They have reached the street where the clinic is located, the last, most dangerous stretch. They will have to cross a major thoroughfare, many street lamps, no opportunity to shelter in shadows. There has been some heavy fighting here recently. Priya sees bodies spread eagled on the ground. Some have fallen into the drains that line the road. At her feet, a hacked off arm covered in blood. Hindu or Muslim, in death, there is no difference. But the slaughter here, she doubles over retching, assisting her father over the last few years. She had believed herself inured to blood. So Priya wants to become a doctor. She's been helping her father in his clinic in the village. Um, that I'll talk to you about the women's dreams in a little while. She had believed herself inured to blood, limbs lost to accidents, but the slaughter here is deeply, differently dreadful. The men too are shocked into stopping. Behind her, Deepa and Jamini moan. Only Bina, their mother, remains fixed on her goal. Hissing at them to be silent, she picks up her pace, giving them no option but to run after her. Lucky that the rioting has moved away, else no burqa could have saved them. Even as Priya thinks this, a group of men comes around the corner. Seeing Bina's small party, they begin to run toward them with frenzied yells. Their leader wields a sword. His forehead is streaked with vermilion, a Hindu mob. Their girls are frozen. Raza and Amit take a stand in front of them, hands fisted, but they look dismayed. The men are carrying rods and knives. One wields an ax. Then Bina, how is she able to think so calmly, so clearly, removes her burqa and drops it to the ground. She orders her daughters to do the same. She pulls the caps off Raza's and Amit's heads and throws those down too. She pushes Raza behind Amit. Then she joins her palms and speaks loudly, addressing the leader. Dada, Goddess Kali herself must have sent you. My children and I are trying to get to my husband, a doctor who was badly wounded, trying to save lives tonight. He is in the clinic down the road. Will you help us get there? The leader is taken aback. One of the men points to the burqas and whispers. Bina says, we were scared to come through this neighborhood, so we disguised ourselves. But see, we are Hindu. She looks the leader in the face and holds up her hands. The leader notes the marriage sindur, crimson on the parting of Bina's hair. 
the iron and conch shell bangles on her arms. The men mutter among themselves, giving the rest of the group only a cursory glance. Finally, the leader says, very well, I will take you to the clinic, but do not venture out again. The next group you might meet might not be so kind. Follow us quickly now. We have much to accomplish tonight. Priya shudders to think what these accomplishments might be. Still, for the moment, these men are their saviors. They hurry behind them, Bina leading the way. Behind her, Deepa has slipped her hand into Raza's. Priya prays the mob will not no notice this questionable gesture. The short stretch of road takes forever. At last, the clinic entrance, the mob melts into the night. Raza knocks on the door, calls to his uncle. His voice shakes. Is he thinking the same thing that keeps running through Priya's head? If the mob had realized he was Muslim, he would not be standing here now. The rest of them might be dead too. Dr. Abdullah cracks open the door. Hurry, hurry. Just before Priya ducks inside, something makes her look up. And the next two sentences are what my mother told me about that night. The sky is a dull red, Calcutta is burning. And Calcutta will burn for several days after this. Thank you. I, I wanted to yes, please give you a fresh mic. OK, a better microphone. I, I wanted to read to you the postscript. The book you will see is in two kinds of styles. One is one that looks at what is going on in the entire country, and that's the beginning of each segment. And then we have these chapters and the voices of the in the consciousness, not the voices, but in the consciousness of the sisters, the uh, you know, in third person. And then I wrote that so I'd have these two different styles the large, the macrocosm and the microcosm in the hopes that people will see how they connect. And then I thought I was done. I sent the book in to my publishers. They were happy. Um, I was happy. Murthy was very happy. <laughs> and um, then one day I'm taking a shower and these lines come to me and I realized the book was not done. So I wrote a postscript. I wrote these words, and just like how they came to me. And it, these lines are addressed to all of you. Here is a river. Here is a wind rising. Here is a village. Here is the year. The river is time, ebbing, flooding. The wind is memory. It can carry flowers. It can carry flames. The village is the world, and you are at its center. The year is now. What will you do with it? What will you do? <laughs>